Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4. Our title this morning is Faith Comes Before Works. Now if you have your bulletin there and it says Faith Before Works, I want you to take a pencil and I want you to insert the word Faith Comes Before Works. I want, I want no under, misunderstanding in what the Scripture shares this morning. As you are read, as you are there in Romans chapter 4, we're going to go back to verse 1 and start there with our scripture reading for this part so that you get the whole flow. The whole first 12 verses all flow together. They're one thought. It says this, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, about Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works... We have, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. But what has the Scripture said? The Scripture says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis chapter 15. Now to him that works the reward not reckoned of grace, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David in the Psalms described the blessedness of a man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Verse 8 we should put with this week's passage. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Does this blessedness come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. But he that receives the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith with which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. The father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of faith are their father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Let's pray again together. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for its completeness. Thank you for its accuracy. Thank you for its inspiration from your very lips and breath. Father, thank you that we can trust it in every avenue in which it speaks. When it speaks of Theology, we can trust it. When it speaks of history, we can trust it. When it speaks of science, we can trust it. When, it. when it speaks of social issues, we can trust it. doesn't matter what it is. It is trustworthy. It is infallible. It's unchangeable. And we thank you for that. Father, may we realize that this morning as we study the truth of your word from the book of Romans this morning. And may we be on guard the false teaching that surrounds us in this world. And we'll give you the thanks and praise and ask for your divine guidance through this hour. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago there came up a question, which comes first, chicken or the egg? You all know the answer, don't you? Chicken. Genesis chapter 1. Chicken was created. Then came eggs. Now my question for you this morning, from the Gospel of God in Romans chapter 4, and actually I give you the answer in the title, don't I? Hmm. Probably shouldn't do that. But you'll remember it. The question is this. Which comes first? Faith or works? Understand that works are important. They're vitally important in the Christian life. If you are missing works, you are missing something crucial. But faith always comes before works. And we're going to see that so, so clearly this morning. Which comes first, faith or works? Obviously, faith comes first. Because that's what our title says. 
Now that's what the scripture says. I want you to see it in these verses this morning. I want you to go with me, Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. And we're going to ask this question, who is faith for? Verse 8 says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Verse 9 says, then does this blessedness, and that blessedness is going back to verse 8 where it says, blessed is the man. Does this blessedness come upon the circumcised only? Or is it, is it for the uncircumcised only? For we say that faith was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. In the first eight chapters of this verse, Paul brings out an example that every Jewish person will understand. Every Jewish person will, 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 will identify with, and that is Abraham. I'm going to tell you a story a little later about Father Abraham. Some of you know that song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. When I was in Bible college, I didn't like that song. There was another song that, uh, that, that we, we sang in our church about our Father Abraham, and I got very upset with it. And, and I didn't like it, and that's not biblical. It's not right until I got to Romans chapter 4. God reached down and said, David, you dummy. You missed that. You've got to read the book of Romans and understand the Old Testament fully. We saw last week that you go to Genesis chapter 15. It says that Abraham was saved by faith. Abraham believed God, quote unquote, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now we have further questions. Where does circumcision come in? Now don't think that circumcision isn't a question today because it is. Okay, in the Presbyterian denomination, circumcision is a doctrine. It is an issue. I'll share that with you a little later on. But we have a couple questions. Number one, the question of works. See, the whole question is, are you saved by works? Or are you saved by faith? And the Jews, well, we're, we're circumcised, so therefore, so therefore we're, we're, we're believers. We're okay. We're saved by our circumcision. And you say, well, it wasn't a thing. But yes, it was a thing because you had people coming along. You have the book of Galatians, and they came along. You have the book of Acts in chapter 15. You have the book of Romans in chapter 4. People were coming along and saying, listen, you're not saved. You're not a full Christian. They might say you don't have the full gospel unless you're circumcised. Now, is there any truth to that? Frankly, I'm going to take an atomic bomb and blow that out of the water by the Word of God this morning. There's no truth to that whatsoever, not an ounce of it, not an itch of it, and anybody that tells you anything else is a false teacher, a false prophet, and you should ignore them, you should shun them, you should stay away from them at all costs. I'm serious about that. Don't even eat with them, the Bible teaches us. What does he say here? Here's the question. Who is faith for? Who is this kind of faith for? Verse 9. Who, with this, this blessedness, where the Lord does not impute sin or put sin to our account. Is this only for the circumcised? Now I'm just going to ask the questions now. We'll answer it in the next verse. Is it only for the circumcised? Can only the circumcised be saved? Or, it says here also, or can it be on the uncircumcised also? Can the uncircumcised be saved by faith? So can only the circumcised be saved by faith? Or can the uncircumcised be saved by faith? And he says there, For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. You say, but, oh, well, well, yes, we'll agree. We will agree that Abraham was saved by faith, but but that's because he was circumcised. <laughs> Good try. It doesn't hold water. Let's look at Abraham in verse 10. It's the second question. When was faith realized? When was faith realized? I, I gave you a couple hints earlier. Verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision... The seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, what? 
yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, Though he might be the father of all them that believe, that righteousness might be imputed, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed also. I just violated one of my big rules. Go back to verse 10. How was it reckoned then? That's the verse. Just put verse 11 in the, put it into a file and hold it in memory. We'll get there in a minute. How was it reckoned? Not? How, how was it reckoned? Was he in circumcision or in uncircumcision? He was not in circumcision, but he was in uncircumcision. So here's a question. When Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, was he circumcised or uncircumcised? Okay, you got your Bibles. Hold your spot there in Romans chapter 4. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. I mentioned earlier, God gives us stamps. God gives us time stamps for these things. If you are in Genesis chapter 12, I wasn't going to go back here, but we need to. Oh yes, here it is. Verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, unto the land that I will show you. This is the beginning of Abram. And I will make you of a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you, and then you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord spoke unto him and Lot with him. And Abraham was how old? Seventy-five. Anybody here seventy-five? Nobody write on seventy-five. Seventy-four? Seventy-six? No? Nobody wants to admit it. All right. All right. We're going to have we're going to have we're going to have Joe over here. He's our imaginary retiree, okay? He's 74. He's 75, all right? So we got Joe that's 75. I know when we get the next one, I know we have some there. All right? Now, go to Genesis chapter 15 with me. Genesis chapter 15. In verse 5, and he believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now let me back up because... Go over to chapter 16. Okay, chapter 15, verse 5, Abraham believes God, it was counted to him for righteousness. All right? Go to chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 3. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, to Egyptian after Abram had dwelt in the land. How long? Ten years. And gave it to her husband Abram to be his wife. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and saw that when she saw he conceived, her mistress despised her eyes. So there's ten years between Abram leaving Ur of the Chaldees when he was 75 years old like Joe over here, to where he's now going into Hagar and having a child by her. And so this is after he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So Abraham, Abram is how old now? 85. How many 85-year-olds do we have here? Come on, put your hand. Edna is. Cliff, are you eight? You, you are. Come on, get your hand up there. All right? So we got a couple 85-year-olds. All right, now go over to chapter 17. Go over to chapter 17. 15 verses. Oh, yeah, I already got these on here. Chapter 17, verse 1. How old is Abram? 99. Anybody 99 here? No, close we got here is 95. All right? 99, older than anybody in this room. How many years between 90, 85 and 99? 14 years. Look at verse 10 with me. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you and every 
and every male child shall be circumcised. Verse 11. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. Verse 24. And Abram, Abraham, in case you didn't get it in verse 1, remember what I said about God repeating himself? Oh, brethren, get this. Get this. God never does anything by mistake. He doesn't repeat himself because he forgot what he said before. He doesn't repeat himself because he has Alzheimer's, okay? He says it because he wants us to know. Verse 24, Ab or Abraham is 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael is the father of who? Islam, all the Arab nations. He said, I'll make of thee a great nation. He, in many nations, he didn't say they'd be good ones. He's the father of Islam. All right? The selfsame day was Abram, Abraham and Ishmael, his son, circumcised. When was faith realized? Go back to Romans chapter 4. See, he says it very, very simply here. He says it very directly in verse 10. How was it then recognized? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? No, not in circumcision, but in, in non-circumcision. There is no way you can say that Abraham's salvation was in any way directly connected to his circumcision. Because they were 14 years apart. 14 years ago was 1996. 1996, that's a long time, isn't it? There was no circumcision. Circumcision hadn't even been invented yet by God. He hadn't even shared that. It has nothing to... You say, now why, why do you make... Pastor, we have no qualms with that. I know that. I know that. But you may very well may face the issue. Let me tell you something this morning. Not all believe in salvation by faith alone. Matter of fact, most of Christianity does not. The Roman Catholic Church, you have to, you have to, and, and I know there are some, there are some even here this morning, you don't like me talking about our denomination. Let me tell you, I'm here to identify the truth and I'm to point out false teaching. Let me tell you the false teaching. The Roman Catholic Church says they have seven sacraments and you have to follow all seven sacraments and you might, you might get into heaven. If you don't believe me, go to Father Joe down the street. Okay? Ask him to teach you about the sacraments. He'll do it. Where do you think I get my information from? I sure don't read it in the Sunday paper. I go to the source. Actually, read the Sunday paper. You can find out what the Latter-day Saints believe. Amazing what they write in there. Right across the street, they do not believe you're saved without baptism. Now, find me a verse on that. You cannot be saved unless you're baptized. All right? Now, I had a dear brother in my first church who had been a former Presbyterian who wasn't immersed. You know why? Now, I believe he was truly saved. They don't mix up on salvation by faith. They've, generally, they, they have that straight if they, if they know their Bible. But they equate circumcision with baptism. And if you don't believe me, go ask a Presbyterian. They're our cousins. Okay? I got a neighbor right across the street. He's a good friend of mine, John. Some of you know him. Okay? And, uh, he, but... They equate baptism. You don't have to be immersed because, you know, it's just, if you do it, that's how they get infant baptism. If you do it early on. Let me tell you something. Did you read Genesis chapter 17? Can you find baptism in there? Can you find anything? That's why I said, 
circumcision is not a sign of faith. Let me say it one more time. Circumcision is not a sign of faith. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant between God and Israel. Between God and... It was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham had already believed. He didn't say, because you believed, I'm giving you circumcision. He says, because I'm giving you this covenant. Go back and read Genesis 17 again. Read it ten times. It'll be clear. Because I'm giving you this covenant. Because Ishmael, let me tell you, Ishmael had not believed. And when they're circumcised on the eighth day, it's not belief. You can't equate baptism and circumcision at all. You just can't. It's against Scripture. It's an abomination to the Lord. What is it then? Why are you making a big deal out of it, Pastor Dave? Because the Bible does. Because the Bible does. And because we are bombarded constantly. And I know that people in our church are bombarded constantly. Well, you're not really saved unless you're baptized. You're not really saved unless you have the Holy Spirit. You're not really saved unless you speak in tongues. You're not really saved unless you're slain in the Spirit. You get that it's all the time. And it's in our neighborhood. It's in our city. It's constant. Now. What does the Bible say? The Bible says Abraham believed God, uncircumcised Abraham, and it was counted to him for righteousness. The Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible says whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do I need to go to the other hundred verses? No. It is very clear. Should a Jewish person be circumcised? Yes, they should. Why? As a sign of the Abrahamic covenant between God and man. Should the Christian be baptized by immersion after salvation? Absolutely, because it's a command of Christ to show his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Does the circumcision save? Does the baptism save? Absolutely not. It is so clear. He says, how was faith realized? He was realized as an uncircumcised. Why? Question number three. You're already here. Why was... Why was circumcision instituted? Well, number one, it was a sign. Go, to me, go with me to verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision as seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. It's a sign. It's a sign to the circumcised. It's a sign to the uncircumcised. It was a sign to the Jews that they have a covenant with God. It was a sign to the uncircumcised that the Jew had a covenant with God. This is why Paul did not take Timothy. Remember, Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And he was under pressure to take Timothy and, and, and to circumcise him. Okay? Interesting argument, interesting discussion. All right? Yeah, one goes one way, one goes the other. Then he had others that came from Jerusalem. They wanted everybody. They wanted, they wanted the French. They wanted the Germans. They wanted the Italians. They wanted the Americans. They wanted the Canadians. They wanted everybody to be circumcised. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. It doesn't teach it at all. It was a sign between God and Israel. Number two, it was a seal. It was a seal. It was a seal of righteousness. It was a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had. That who had? Abraham had. You say, oh, it says there then, if we have faith, we should be circumcised. This is... No, 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 no. It doesn't say you. It doesn't say me. It says Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed God because God said, I will give you land, seed, and blessing. I will do this. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. 
Abraham did not know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he knew about the coming death, burial, and resurrection. He knew something was coming, and he believed God. And then as that faith, and that faith specifically in the covenant, then he was circumcised. That he might be the father, being uncircumcised, that he might be the father... His faith was when he was uncircumcised, very clear again, that he might be the father of all them that believe. There's a retired pastor down in Florida. His wife just died. His name's Milo Thompson. He's one of the greatest men I've ever known. Still preaches and teaches and travels, and if he's ever up here in Minnesota, I'll have him in. Like I was telling you earlier, I got, I got upset. I, I was, here I was, Bible college student. Talk to Caleb and Jordan. They know how Bible college students are. Right, guys? Yeah. You know everything when you know nothing. Sometimes God lets you go for a while. Now I went in to see Pastor Thompson. There were two things. I, I, I said, I, don't, I just don't feel this verse, this song is right, and we shouldn't be singing it because it talks about Abraham, our father, and, we're, and then we're mixing up covenant theology here and the church and Israel separate he probably let me go on for a while and I forget if we talked, prayed, what and then I left he never said a whole lot but he did say a whole lot then about three years later I was in my first church and I was working on a series through the book of Romans and I came to chapter 4 <laughs> and it's like Pastor Thompson, why didn't you tell me this? You know why? He wanted me to learn it for my own. Smart man. Smart man. You ever run into a man named Milo Thompson? I don't know of another man in the world by that name. You shake his hand and say thank you for being patient with young preachers. And I came here, and why? He was uncircumcised so that he could be the father of all. He could be a spiritual father to all, whether they're uncircumcised. And we always think, well, Abraham is the father of Israel. He's the father of all who believe, both the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Though they be not circumcised, what does he say? Well, he, he was the example that righteousness must, might be imputed to them. Number one, it was a sign. Number two, it was a seal. It wasn't a seal of his faith. It was a seal of his covenant, of the covenant, and his faith in that covenant. Okay? Number three, it was a standard. It was a standard. That the righteousness might be imputed to them also. What is he doing? He's setting it up that someday the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go into the, all the world. Not only in Jerusalem and Judea, but Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And someday, 4,000, not quite 4,000, probably 3,000 years later, there's going to be a discussion, there's going to be an argument. Can you be saved only if you're circumcised, or can you be uncircumcised and be saved by faith? And God says, go back in history with me. Let me show you that righteousness can be imputed, can be put on the account of the uncircumcised as well, and that's good news for you and for me. In verse 12, And the father of circumcision, to them that are not of the circumcision only, but also those who walk in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. At the same time, he is not only the father of faith to the uncircumcised, he is the father of faith to the circumcised. Don't think that Israel is discounted in any way here. Matter of fact, when we get over in the Romans chapter 9 and 10, he will say that you are of Israel, but you're not all of Israel. You're Jews, but you're not Jews. You have the works, you have the circumcision, but you don't have the faith. That's why I don't like that term, confirmation. You know the Bible teaches confirmation? The Bible actually says you are confirmed, but not the way the world practices it. The way the world practices is you learn these things, you learn, these, you learn the catechism. Even catechism is not a bad word, but it's misused. 
And because you've been baptized, because you have done the catechism, I now confirm you. And I'm going to tell you that probably 99% that are confirmed in our so-called evangelical Christian churches are lost and dying and going to hell. And if I'm wrong, I'll be happy and glad to this day to be wrong. Because I would rather tell a saved person they're lost than a lost person they're saved. Because if I tell a lost person that you're saved, you're confirmed, you're all right, you're going to heaven, they will never come to Jesus Christ because my pastor, and I've heard this, my priest, my minister has taken care of it for me and I can't take care of anybody. So you may say, why do you harp on it? Because the world is full of false teaching, full of false doctrine. And because of that false doctrine, men and women, boys and girls are going to hell this morning. And we need to be the lighthouse. We need to be the voice of truth. If they don't get it from us who believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, stand outside a church this morning. Pick any church you want. I don't care what it is. Maybe a fundamental Baptist church. Watch how many are carrying their Bibles as they go in. If they're not carrying their Bibles when they go in, what are they doing inside? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're being entertained. They have religiosity. And they're dying and going to hell. God's doing great things around the world. It's easier for God to do things around the world where paganism and Satanism and voodooism and mysticism is rampant. Because there is a dark contrast between light and darkness, it is very difficult to evangelize the United States of America because already everybody says they're Christian. Everybody says they're religious. Everybody says they believe in God. What do I need your style for? But it's the truth. It's the truth because it's God's Word. It's what God says. He that believeth and is baptized is saved, but he that believeth not, what? Is condemned already. Mark chapter 16. The very words of Jesus before he went back to heaven. It was a sign of the covenant. It was a seal of his righteousness. It was a standard that Abraham was the leader of. He was the Father. He is the first one that we have this clear record of that he believed God, he believed, and it was counted for him for righteousness. It was a show that there's a walk of faith and a show that faith comes without circumcision. Was it bad for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the rest to be circumcised? No. Just don't count on that for your salvation. Is it wrong for your car to have a good paint job? No. All right, got a young man here, just bought a car this week, and he's going to make it the most beautiful car in the world, aren't you, Caleb? Yep. Okay. But he can have a beautiful paint job, and, and all the... I, we, I took the boys to the classic car show yesterday, and I said, these are cars with chrome bumpers. <laughs> and... Yeah, what are, what are they? Wasn't that the day when you had chrome bumpers? I love chrome bumpers. I said, to, I said to my boys, I said, these are the easy ones. They said, a bunch of nuts and bolts. I said, you don't understand. You can reach the distributor. You can reach the, you, any, any, you can reach the fuel pump right there. You don't have to drop half the vehicle. So you got a great paint job before I get away from this. Boy, it is glossy, maybe metallic, and everything. Wheels are just right. Everything's perfect. But when you lift the hood, nothing there. Green paint job, no engine. That's like faith. That's like works without faith. Looks good on the outside. It's dead on the inside. It's dead on the inside. Get your engine running. Get the motor working right. Get the faith in place. 
and then get the outside right. Tell you something, if you get that engine running right, you get that car working right, you get the faith there, you'll want to get the rest done. You will. Faith. Why was circumcised in, circumcision instituted? As a sign, as a seal, as a standard. Faith always comes first. Faith always comes first. First, there are no exceptions. None. Never has been, never will be. Number two, faith should always be followed by works. Okay? Faith should always be followed by works. It's not that works aren't there. It's not that they're unimportant. It's not that they're not a part of things. It's just they have to be in their right place. And that goes universally across the board. Would you bow with me, please? Before we pray, just I want you to make sure. I, I might have made some people mad this morning. I... Sorry for making you bad, but I'm going to be straight and true to the Word of God and talk to Him. It's not my book. I'm just the messenger of it. It's wonderful to see some young preachers coming along that know how to preach the book. Oh, what a joy that was this week. Where are you? You understand fully that faith is first. Probably many of you here this morning, no, oh, that's, that's not a question. I knew that. I hope I put some cement. I hope I put some cement where there were some timbers before. Cement that into your mind. Go back and read Genesis. Read Romans. Read Ephesians. Read, read the Gospels. It's, it, read Corinthians. It's clear. It's clear. It's clear. Don't let anybody sway you. Anybody that says any difference is a false teacher and is a liar. 1 John says that. Number two, not only do you know the truth, number two, will you stand for the truth? Stand for the truth in love. Don't ever fall, don't ever turn away from the truth, but doing lovingly. Always leave yourself a door open if you can for the future. There are sometimes somebody's, you, you, you stand for the truth and teach truth and somebody's going to get mad and walk away. If they do, that's their choice. You can't, you can't do anything about that. At least they went away saying, I can't stand before the Lord and say I never heard. In 27 years of ministry, there's never been a funeral that I've preached. And I preached one for a Jewish man once. There's never been a funeral that I preached that people could walk away from and say, I did not hear the gospel. And I hope for how many years the Lord gives me that will still be true. Will that be true of you? If you have questions about this, if this has raised questions or concerns or thoughts in your mind, talk to us afterwards. We'll be glad to visit with you. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you that it is clear. Father, help each one of us in this room this morning to see the clearness, to understand the clearness. Maybe somebody doesn't see it this morning because their eyes are blinded and they need Jesus Christ. They need the Holy Spirit of God to take those scales off the eyes. Father, thank you for Paul. Thank you for his boldness. Thank you for his love. Thank you for God who worked in his life and brought him out of his stooped Judaism to understand that Jesus Christ was the one he was persecuting. And he became a follower of the Savior. Father, help us now to serve you and love you with all of our hearts and be a light in a darkened world. For we'll thank you in Christ's precious name. Amen.